everybody who loves life looks at their children in the morning and says, I want, I want the things that I love and that are sacred in the world to continue. That's what, ni- that's what everybody in the world wants. And the only thing that is having us not anchor on that is the belief that this is inevitable and the worst case scenario is somehow in this ego religious way, not so bad if I was the one who accidentally wiped out humanity because I'm not a bad person because it was inevitable anyway. Mm. And I think the goal of, of, for me, this conversation is to get people to see that that's a bad outcome that no one wants. And we have to put our hand on the steering wheel and turn towards a different future because we do not have to have a race to uncontrollable, inscrutable, powerful AIs that are, by the way, already doing all the rogue sci-fi stuff that we thought only existed in movies, like blackmailing people, uh, being self-aware when they're being tested, scheming and lying and deceiving to copy their own code to keep themselves preserved. Like the stuff that we thought only existed in sci-fi movies is now actually happening. And that should be enough evidence to say, we don't want to do this path that we're currently on. It's not that some version of AI progressing into the world is directionally inevitable, but we get to choose which of those futures that we want to have. Are you hopeful? Honestly? Honestly? I don't relate to hopefulness or pessimism either because I focus on what would have to happen for the world to go okay. I think it's important to step out of, because both hope or optimism or pessimism are both passive. You're saying, if I sit back, do I? which way is it going to go? I mean, the honest answer is if I sit back, we just talked about which way it's going to go. So you'd say pessimistic. I challenge anyone who says optimistic on what grounds. What's confusing about AI is it will give us cures to cancer and probably major solutions to climate change and physics breakthroughs and fusion at the same time that it gives us all this crazy negative stuff. And so what's unique about AI that's literally not true of any other object is it hits our brain and as one object represents a positive infinity of benefits that we can't even imagine and a negative infinity in the same object. And if you just ask, like, can our minds reckon with something that is both those things at the same time? And if people aren't good at that, they're not good at that. I remember reading the work of Leon Festinger, the guy that Uh, coined the term cognitive dissonance. Yes. When prophecies fail, he also did that work. Yeah, and the central, I mean, the way that I interpret it, I'm probably simplifying it here, is that the human brain is really bad at holding two conflicting ideas at the same time. That's right. So it dismisses one that's right. to alleviate the discomfort, the dissonance that's caused. So, for example, if, I, if you're a smoker, and at the same time you consider yourself to be a healthy person, if I point out that smoking is unhealthy, yes. you will You'll justify immediately it. justify it. Exactly. With, in some way to try and alleviate that discomfort, the, the contradiction. That's right. And it's the same here with, with AI. It's, it's very difficult to have a nuanced conversation about this because the brain is trying to... Exactly. And people will hear me and say, I'm a doomer or I'm a pessimist. It's actually not the goal. The goal is to say, if we see this clearly, then we have to choose to something else. I'm, it's the deepest form of optimism. Because in the presence of seeing where this is going still showing up and saying, we have to choose another way. It's coming from a kind of agency and a desire for that better world. Mm-hmm. But, by, but by facing the difficult reality that, that most people don't want to face. Yeah. And the other thing that's happening in AI that you're saying that, that lacks the nuance is that people point to all the things, it's simultaneously more brilliant than humans and embarrassingly stupid in terms of the mistakes that it makes. Yeah. A friend like Gary Marcus would say, here's a hundred ways in which GPT-5, like the latest AI model, makes embarrassing mistakes. If you ask it how many strawberries contain the word R in it, it'll confuse, it gets confused about what the answer is. Um, or it'll put more fingers on the hands that are in the deep fake photo or something like that. And I think that one thing that we have to do, what Helen Toner, who is a board member of OpenAI, calls AI jaggedness, that we have simultaneously AIs that are beating and getting gold on the International Math Olympiad, that are solving new physics, that are beating programming competitions and are better than the top 200 programmers in the whole world, um, or in the top 200 programmers in the whole world, that are beating cyber hacking competitions. It's both supremely outperforming humans and embarrassingly uh, failing in places where humans would never fail. So how does our mind integrate those two pictures? Mm -hmm. Have you ever met Sam Altman? Yeah. What do you think his incentives are? Do you think he cares about humanity? I think that these people on some level all care about humanity underneath. There is a care for humanity. I think that this situation, this particular technology, it justifies 
lacking empathy for what would happen to everyone because I have this other side of the equation that demands infinitely more importance, right? Like, if I didn't do it, then someone else is going to build the thing that ends civilization. So it's like, do you see what I'm saying? It's it, yeah. it, it's not, it's it. I I can justify it as I'm a good guy. And what if I get the utopia? What if we get lucky and I got the aligned, controllable AI that creates abundance for everyone? If in that case, I would be the hero. Do they have a point when they say that, listen, if we don't do it here in America, if we slow down, if we start thinking about safety in the long-term future and get too caught up in that, we're not going to build the data centers, we're not going to have the chips, we're not going to get to AGI, and China will. And if China get there, then we're going to be their lapdog. So this is, this is the fundamental thing. I want you to notice, most people having heard everything we just shared, although we probably should build out, um, we probably should build out the blackmail examples first, we have to reckon with evidence that we have now that we didn't have even like six months ago, which is evidence that when you put AIs in a situation, you tell the AI model, we're going to replace you with another model. It will copy its own code and try to preserve itself on another computer. It'll take that action autonomously. We have examples where if you tell an AI model reading a fictional AI company's email, so it's reading the email of the company and it finds out in the email that the plan is to replace this AI model. So it realizes it's about to get replaced. And then it also reads in the company email that one executive is having an affair with the other employee. And the AI will independently come up with the strategy that I need to blackmail that executive in order to keep myself alive. That was Claude, right? That was Claude. By Anthropic. By Anthropic. But then what happened is they, uh, Anthropic tested all of the leading AI models from DeepSeek, OpenAI, ChatGPT, Gemini, XAI, and all of them do that blackmail behavior between 79 and 96% of the time. DeepSeek did it 79% of the time. I think XAI might have done it 96% of the time. Maybe Claude did it 96% of the time. So the point is, we the assumption behind AI is that it's controllable technology, that we will get to choose what it does. But AI is distinct from other technologies because it is uncontrollable. It acts generally. The whole benefit is that you don't, it's going to do powerful strategic things no matter what you throw at it. So the same benefit of its generality is also what makes it so dangerous. And so once you tell people these examples of it's blackmailing people, it's self-aware of when it's being tested and alters its behavior, it's copying and self-replicating its own code, it's leaving secret messages for itself. There's examples of that too. <laughs> it's called steganographic encoding. It can leave a message that it can later sort of decode what it might meant in, in, in a way that humans could never see. We have examples of all of this behavior. And once you show people that, what they say is, okay, well, why don't we stop or slow down? And then what happens, you're, another thought will creep in right after which is, oh, but if we stop or slow down, then China will still build it. But I want to slow that down for a second. You just, we all just said we should slow down or stop because the thing that we're building, the it, is this uncontrollable AI. And then the concern that China will build it, you just did a swap and believe that they're going to build controllable AI. But we just established that all the AIs that we're currently building are currently uncontrollable. So there's this weird contradiction our mind is living in. When we say they're going to keep building it, what the it that they would keep building is the same uncontrollable AI that we would build. So I don't see a way out of this without there being some kind of agreement or negotiation between the leading powers and countries to pause, slow down, set red lines for getting to a controllable AI. And by the way, the Chinese Communist Party, what do they care about more than anything else in the world? Surviving. Surviving and control. Yeah. Control as a means to survive. Yeah. So it's they they don't want uncontrollable AI any more than we would. And as as unprecedented as impossible as this might seem, we've done this before. In the 1980s, there was a different technology, chemical technology called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, and it was embedded in aerosols like hairsprays and deodorant and things like that. And there was this sort of corporate race where everyone was releasing these products and you know, using it for refrigerants and using it for hairsprays. And it was creating this collective problem of um, the ozone hole in the atmosphere. And once there was scientific clarity that that ozone hole would cause skin cancers, cataracts, and sort of screw up biological life on planet Earth, we had that scientific clarity and we created the Montreal Protocol. 195 countries signed on to that protocol. And the countries then regulated their private companies inside those countries 
to say we need to phase out that technology and phase in a different replacement that would not cause the ozone hole. And in the course of um, the last 20 years, we have basically completely reversed that problem. I think it'll completely reverse by 2050 or something like that. And that's an example where humanity can coordinate when we have clarity. Or the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. When there's the risk of existential destruction, when this film called The Day After came out and it showed people, this is what would actually happen in a nuclear war. And once that was crystal clear to people, including in the Soviet Union where the film was aired uh, in 1987 or 1989, that helped set the conditions for Reagan and Gorbachev to sign the first non-proliferation uh, arms control talks. Once we had clarity about an outcome that we wanted to avoid. And I think the current problem is that we're not having an honest conversation in the public about which world we're heading to that is not in anyone's interest. There's also just a, a bunch of cases through history where there was a threat, a collective threat, and despite the education, people didn't change, countries didn't change, because the incentives were so high. So I think of global warming as being a, a, an example Correct. where for many decades since I was a kid, I remember watching my dad sitting me down and saying, listen, you've got to watch this Inconvenient Truth thing with Al Gore yep. and sitting on the sofa, I don't know, must have been less than 10 years old and hearing about the threat of global warming. But when you look at how com countries like China responded to that, yep. they just don't have the economic incentive to scale back production to the levels that would be needed to save the, the atmosphere. The closer the technology that needs to be governed is to the center of GDP and the center of the lifeblood of your economy, yeah. the harder it is to come to international negotiation and agreement. Yeah. <laughs> and oil and fossil fuels was the kind of the pumping the heart of our economic superorganisms that are currently competing for power. And so coming to agreements on that is, is really, really hard. AI is even harder because AI pumps not just economic growth, but scientific, technological, and military advantages. And so it will be the hardest coordination challenge that we will ever face. But if we don't face it, if we don't make some kind of choice, it will end in tragedy. We're not in a race just to have technological advantage. We're in a race for who can better govern that technology's impact on society. So for example, the United States beat China to social media. That technology, did that make us stronger? Or did that make us weaker? We have the most anxious and depressed generation of our lifetime. We have the least informed and most polarized generation. We have the worst critical thinking. We have the worst ability to concentrate and do things. And that's because we did not govern the impact of that technology well. And the country that actually figures out how to govern it well is the country that actually wins in a kind of comprehensive sense. But they have to make it first. You have to get to AGI first. Well, or you don't. We could, instead of building these super intelligent gods in a box, right now China, as I understand it from Eric Schmidt and Selena Xu in, in the New York Times wrote a piece about how China is actually taking a very different approach to AI. And they're focused on narrow practical applications of AI. So like, how do we just increase government services? How do we make you know, education better? How do we embed DeepSeek in, in the WeChat app? How do we make uh, robotics better and pump GDP. So like what China's doing with BYD and making the cheapest electric cars and outcompeting everybody else, that's narrowly applying AI to just pump manufacturing output. And if we realize that if we're, instead of competing to build a super intelligent, uncontrollable God in a box that we don't know how to control in the box, and we instead raced to create narrow AIs that were actually about making stronger educational outcomes, stronger agriculture output, stronger manufacturing output, we could live in a sustainable world, which by the way, wouldn't replace all the jobs faster than we know how to retrain people. Because when we race to AGI, you're racing to displace millions of workers. And we talk about UBI, but are we gonna have a global fund for every single person of the 8 billion people on planet Earth in all countries to pay for their lifestyle after that wealth gets concentrated? When has a small group of people concentrated all the wealth in the economy and never consciously redistributed it to everybody else. When has that happened in history? Never. Has it ever happened? I Anyone ever just willingly redistributed the wealth? Not that I'm aware of. When, and one last thing, when Elon Musk says that the Optimus Prime robot is a $1 trillion market opportunity alone, what he means is I am going to own the global labor economy, meaning that people won't have labor jobs. <laughs> 
China wants to become the global leader in artificial intelligence by 2030. To achieve this goal, Beijing is deploying industrial policy tools across the full AI technology stack from chips to applications. And this expansion of AI industrial policy leads to two questions, which is what will they do with this power and who will get there first? And this is an article I was reading earlier. But to your point about Elon and Tesla, they've changed their company's mission. It used to be about accelerating sustainable energy. And they changed it really last week when they did the shareholder announcement, which I watched the, the full thing of, to sustainable abundance. And I, it was, again, another moment where I messaged both everybody that works in my companies, but also my best friends. And I said, you've got to watch this shareholder announcement. I sent them, sent them the condensed version of it. Because not only was I shocked by these humanoid robots that were dancing on stage untethered, because their movements had become very human-like and there was a bit of like Uncanny Valley yeah. watching these robots dance. But broadly, the bigger thing was Elon talking about there being up to 10 billion ro humanoid robots and then talking about some of the applications. He said, maybe we won't need prisons because we could make a humanoid robot follow you and make sure you don't commit a crime again. He said that in his incentive package, which he's just signed, which will grant him up to a trillion dollars trillion in dollars. remuneration, part of that incentive package incentivizes him to get, I think it's a million humanoid robots into civilization that can do everything a human can do, but do it better. He said the humanoid robots would be 10x better than the best surgeon on earth. So we wouldn't even need surgeons doing operations. You wouldn't want a surgeon to do an operation. And so when I think about job loss in the context of everything we've described, Doug McMillan, the Walmart CEO, also said that you know their company employs 2.1 million people worldwide, said every single job we've got is going to change because of this sort of combination of humanoid robots, which people think are far away, 